Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Ephron Olive, and I'm back here today again with Tomer. How's it going today, Tomer? I'm doing well, Seth. We're, I'm ready for round two of the Commander Review of you. Yes, we talked about the cats, and today it is Dragon Day. So we're going to break down Draconic Domination, the Dragon deck from Commander 2017. Like last time, we'll do a quick overview of the Precon deck, and then we'll talk about all the new cards. So, Tomer, why don't you take it away and give us your overall thoughts on the Dragon deck from Commander 2017? I think Draconic Domination epitomizes battle cruiser magic that commander is kind of known for so if you if you want to play a deck that is all about dragons number one then obviously pick this but if you also want to play a deck that has like just the biggest creatures coming onto the battlefield the flashiest effects all like the pizzazz that a more casual multiplayer format is known for, then Draconic Domination is probably the easiest choice of the bunch. You just play big creatures, big old dragons, big effects. Everything about this deck is big. I mean, that's the whole deck. It's ramp, and it's huge dragons. Tons yeah. and tons and tons of huge dragons. That's what you're doing, and, I mean, it seems pretty sweet. And it does, it is very... Uh, reminiscent of what Commander kind of started out to be with the Elder Dragons, Elder Dragon Highlander, yeah. EDH, that whole thing. Like, as this Dragon the name. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of the heart of what Commander originally started out as. So I think that that is pretty sweet. And even more exciting, the deck got some awesome new Dragon Commanders. So let's start off talking about the new Dragon Legends. We have a total of five new Legends in the dragon deck, but only four of them are dragons. So let's start off with the face card, the Ur Dragon, the new five color dragon. This thing is huge. The Eminence card. What do you think of this one, Tomer? I think lo anybody looking at the Ur Dragon, I think it would melt even the coldest spike heart. <laughs> if you look at the Ur Dragon, you, just the inner Timmy just squeals of joy. It's a 10 10 flyer. Makes your dragons cost less, blah, blah, blah. But whenever one or more of your dragons <laughs> attack, you draw that many cards and you put a permanent from your hand onto the battlefield, which is going to be another huge dragon. I mean, this is awesome. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's so get sweet. A, I can't be too critical about a deck, uh, about a card that this is this flashy, this big, and this robust i don't know it's it's really it's really fun that's the first word that comes to my head is this card is fun whether or not it's the best card ever i think it's actually quite solid dragons as a tribe are on the high end of the converted mana cost it's because dragons you always associate with large converted mana costs and that's what wizards of the coast has stuck with so being able to cast everything for one less is much needed if you're building a deck devoted about casting dragons as opposed to cheating them into play with like Kalia or whatnot. Um, so that, that ability is really, really useful and, and much needed. And then the attack ability, once it actually enters the battlefield, it's a 10 10. <laughs> it's going to kill creature people pretty quickly with commander damage. But also when you're attacking, you get to draw a bunch of cards. You get to put more things onto the battlefield, cheat them into play. It seems solid overall. Yeah. It seems really, really powerful, really fun. If you ever get it on the battlefield, by the time this comes down, after making all your other dragons cheaper, you're going to draw most likely a bunch of cards right away. It almost like in a sense has haste. It's not an enter the battlefield ability, but you just play it on your pre-combat main phase. So you're not worried about your opponent really wrathing away all your dragons. You're going to draw a new handful of cards and have this huge board full of dragons. It feels like once you actually get to the point of casting this, assuming you do, it's going to be hard to lose most games. You get a huge advantage the very first turn you cast it and starting off with, uh, Dragon Lord Servant, I think, is the card. The one mana mm -hmm. cost reduction just in your command zone all the time is a huge deal because dragons are so expensive. And being able to cast your six mana dragons for five and your seven mana dragons for six, it's going to add up to a lot of mana that it saved you just for doing nothing, just for choosing as your commander. And when you think about five color dragons, there's only two 
five color dragon commanders or real tribal based five color dragon commanders, mm-hmm. the Ur dragon and Scion of the Ur dragon. And I think there's a pretty good argument that the Ur dragon might be the, the best five color dragon commander. From a competitive standpoint, I would say I would still put my lot with Scion of the Ur dragon just because you can do silly things such as uh, discarding a molten steel dragon and then pumping up your Scion and then uh, discarding a infect dragon like Scytherix and then just one shotting somebody in in a pretty fast and decisive way. And there's also like silliness with like World Gorge or Dragon and whatnot. However, if you want to actually cast your dragons from your hand, the Ur Dragon is the best. I mean, if you want to play a like a more straightforward game of beatdown battle cruise of magic which a lot of people, myself included, want and prefer over like a cheaty reanimate type effect. Uh, the Ur Dragon is fantastic and it does its job really well. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next legendary dragon. Oh man, I love this card. This might be my favorite mm-hmm. new legend from all of Commander <gasps> 2017, Ramos Dragon Engine. So Tomer, <laughs> what do you think of this new dragon? This is why we're friends, Seth, because this is my <laughs> favorite card from the Commander. <laughs> and the Ramos Dragon Engine is so fun. Uh, one of my favorite archetypes that I get to play now and then in Commander is the multicolor archetype. Um, there's variations of it, like the Lucky Charms archetype, where you basically play all the charm cards in Magic the Gathering. These are instant speed uh, modular spells. They come in all sorts of colors. A lot of them are actually multicolor, and they all do like different things, like Band Charm can tuck a creature or destroy something, and and they all they all have a, a unique ability for every single um, every single mode and every single charm. Uh, they're really fun to play, um, and we never really had a commander that actually cared about multicolored before, so it's really fun to see Ramus Dragon Engine show up. We actually just don't have a lot of good five-color commanders in general that have build-around-me abilities, and Ramos is definitely that. It wants you to play multi-color cards. It wants you to go big. Uh, Ramus also um, rewards you heavily for doing so by, first of all, getting really, really big, so you can very easily kill somebody with commander damage. But more importantly, and the most interesting of all, you can remove five counters to make 10 mana, 10 mana to cast giant spells. You can only do this once each turn, but you can also do it on your opponent's turn. So it works very well with instant abilities, and it also works very well if you have any way of giving all your spells flash, like Vidalcan Orrery, for example. Ramos is fun. I, I I don't know. I'm going to start rambling. So Ramus is fun. <laughs> uh, it is so fun. And it's exactly the right amount of mana to kill someone with door to nothingness, uh-huh. which is the main thing I want to do. But the cool thing about this is I build a lot of five color commander decks. I just like to play good dirtly cards, which requires lots of different colors to play all the best dirtles. The problem is... There's not many, like you mentioned, there's no actually five color commander that actually cares about that. I end up sticking a Taga Tog in there because it looks funny or something like that. So it's really sweet to have a five color commander that actually rewards you for playing things of lots of different colors, which is something that just has been missing in Magic. No longer do I have to play some random tribal sliver or uh, a mm-hmm. Taga Tog as my commander. I have something that really works there now. It can be a super janky but really sweet kind of Voltron commander as well. If you're playing Conflux and Maelstrom Archangels, it would be pretty easy with the mana that you can generate from Ramos Engine to just put so many counter on this so quickly and just one shot your opponent with commander damage just all around there's so many sweet and fun things that you can do with this card there's janky things you can do with this card just i love this card it's so sweet all around i'm so excited to cast conflux with the the five plus one plus one counters on ramos and then immediately get five counters back (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and you get that 10 mana, potentially. Like, if you cast it naturally, you can use the mana to cast the cards you got with Conflux. There's just, yeah. there's so much potential there. Also, worth mentioning, uh, 
blink shenanigans, the once each turn thing, like you can empty mm-hmm. the counters for 10 mana, reset it with something to make, cast a five mana, five color card, like Maelstrom Archangel, get oh 10 more goodness. mana for five <laughs> mana, blink it again, and just kind of like go pseudo infinite with stu- with five color cards. There's so many possibilities with Ramos. Yeah, this is a very powerful card. Highly abusable, but also highly... Um... It can highly just push janky uh, archetypes to to something viable as well. This is the five color commander I've been waiting for. Really, let's move on to another five color commander, Okagachi Aww. Vengeful Kami. Uh, and this one, eh? After Ramos, it's almost yeah. disappointing in some sense, but it's pretty sweet. It it, it, yeah. it makes opponents not attack you. Kind of, yeah. it's got Kamigawa flavor. Is that Tomer, what, what, do you, what do you think? It, okay, so. I, I've used this term before, rattlesnake cards. These are cards that um, basically punish your opponents for messing with you, but the difference is that they're on the battlefield and all your opponents know it's what it could do, so they have to play differently. They can't play around a Swords of Plowshares or a Condemn they don't know, but like if, if they're going to attack you and you condemn their creature, they, they can't really play around it unless they know you have a Condemn in your hand. Uh, Okagachi, for ex- differently, however, is on the board, so if your opponents attack you, they know what's up, and they shouldn't be surprised. So, in theory, Okagachi is going to be able to attack as a 6-6 flyer trampler and not have to worry about being swung back at because there's the threat that Okagachi can go after that person the next turn and start exiling things. And that ability is kind of powerful. It's kind of like a pseudo vigilance, I guess, and it's going to deter attacks. But I just, it's just a lot of mana for this ability. And, and I just don't like it, Seth. I don't know. So, so let me give the good side. There is one thing I love about Okagachi. Overall, Uh I'm not excited about it, but, one of the biggest failings, I think, of Kamigawa, a set that is overwhelmed, it's all about legends, it's overwhelmed <laughs> with legends, there is not a five-color spirit legend in Magic. I, If you if you can uh. count the number of times I've tried to build five-color spirits and put Genju of the Realms as my commander, but then realized it's not actually a creature, it's an yeah. enchantment that turns a land into a creature. So I love the fact that this gives us a five-color spirit commander. There are five colors of spirits back in Kamigawa, all different kinds of spirits, and we've never had a commander to lead them and it like i was mentioning with ramos it's super awkward to play five color spirits and have a tagatag be your commander that just doesn't that doesn't seem yeah. right yeah. so i love that it resolves that issue for that one specific deck if you want to build fi- build five color spirits we actually have a five color spirit commander now otherwise eh, i'm kind of like mediocre on the card yeah i, I actually thought so you mentioned that it's actually a good um commander for like a kamigawa theme it's also a flavor win for kamigawa themes because the kamikawa set is historically a underpowered set an underpowered block <laughs> and now we have an equally underpowered commander for the underpowered set it's a flavor win <laughs> oh well we have one more dragon commander and this one's kind of walking the line between yesterday and today wasatora yeah. nakuru queen the cat dragon is uh, a cat I, I have to say, I, there's one reason I'm extremely disappointed in this card. If you look at its colors, it's green, it's red, it's black, there's no white. And you know, cats are white. If you look at the cats in Magic, they're almost all white. Why couldn't this be Naya or Abzan or something so you could play this in a cat deck? I have no idea, honestly. Um... No, I've, it could have been Naya. I'm not sure. I, I would love to hear maybe the designers of the set explain the colors. Also, the, the colors in the Zon, too. That would be fun for me to hear. Um, but as a card itself, I think it's highly efficient at what it does. Um, it's loaded with value. It's a 5-4 flying trample um, for for 5 mana, which is already pretty good stats. Um, it forces your opponents to sacrifice a creature, which is incredibly powerful. I run a Thraxamundar deck that does a very similar thing, so I know how powerful just a repeatable sacrifice a creature effect is. Um, and if you don't, you get this adorable 3-3 flying token creature with such a really, really cute artwork. So it's a win-win either way. It's really great. It's really aggressive. Um, it's a fun... 
It's a fun card for a dragon uh, tribal deck as part of the 99. It still works as part of a Jun Commander style deck that is all about sacrifice as a sub theme and maybe a devour mechanic and maybe a token mechanic. All these things that Jun supports very well. It works really well. Token doublers like Parallel Lies and others, other such things. It's just a solid card. It's not broken. It's not going to open up any crazy combos or crazy synergies, but it's just a really good aggressively costed card. Card. I think, like, out of, out of the group that we play with, I would say this is a card that Tom would be enjoying the most out of these. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I think it's, for me, primarily a 99 card. It's just, in your Jun colors, you're playing lots of removal, it's an efficient threat, it generates value whether your opponent has a creature or not. With four players at the table, you can kind of mm-hmm. choose, like, if you really need the token for some reason, try to attack someone that doesn't have a creature for some reason. If you want your opponent to sacrifice something, get in, flying and trample makes it pretty likely that you're going to be able to get in combat damage, even through some chump blockers, potentially. So I think it's a good card. I'm just disappointed that there's no white for cat dragon potential crossover decks. Well, let's move on to our last commander. And this is a commander that kind of, sort of, a little bit cares about dragons uh taigum <laughs> ojitai master i bad. i have to say the dragon text feels tacked on to me i feel like they made this card uh without the dragon text and then <laughs> couldn't print it for some reason in like dragons of tarkir it like didn't fit or they had to cut it so then they tacked on the dragon text and put it in commander 2017 it's a sweet card though i think what do you think of this one tomer i i think the dragon part is a little bit weird i i I guess they're like, well, we're making a dragon deck, and this <laughs> card does nothing for the dragon deck. Let's just throw in the dragon card. Like they just, yeah, it feels like a last minute, like, and dragons, just <laughs> in there. And dragons, yeah, and dragons. Um, as a card, I, 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 I went like from happy to sad to happy again. I'm, I really think this is a cool card. I love Rebound as an ability. I like that it makes your instants and sorceries um, uncounterable. I think that's more relevant than the dragon part because Tygem really wants to be um, the commander of a deck of a spell slinger deck. You want a deck full of instants and sorceries. He's also fine as part of the 99 too, but he wants to be in a deck that is mostly instants and sorceries so you can give all of them Rebound and just cast a spell, have it come back next turn, cast it again. It's really, really fun that way. And I was really pumped about that initially. And then I started thinking about it more. I'm like, well, it's kind of like a weaker Narset Enlightened Master, which does a similar thing. It cares all about instants of sorceries, but it pulls them from the library instead. So that's like repeatable card advantage. And realistically, what Tygum is going to be is going to be a time warp deck. <laughs> all you want to do is you want to attack with Tygum, <laughs> cast your Time Warp, rebound it, attack with Tygum, draw more cards, Time Warp, take more turns, Tygum, 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 attack again, Warp, 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 extra turns. I, and that's basically Narset, except this is like a little bit worse Narset, I guess. I don't know why you're using that voice, Tomer. That sounds like decks that you play every other every other <laughs> month on Commander Clash. Only spooky <laughs> decks. Only spooky decks. Um, I, I will say there is one cool uh, little synergy with Tygem that um, even Narset can't pull off, and that's uh, locking your opponents with Dovescape. So Dovescape is this cool little enchantment <laughs> that says whenever a player plays a non-creature spell, which includes instants or sorceries, counter that spell, and that player puts X 1-1 one, one tokens, uh, bird tokens to play, where X is the spell's converted mana cost. So what Tygum does with it on the field, your opponents cannot play non-creature spells, or else they get birds instead. However, Tygum lets you play the, 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 the spells, the instants or sorceries, and it resolves because it can't be countered, but still, Dovescape will still give you birds. So you get to cast your spells and get your birds. At the same time, that, your opponents just get birds. I, uh, yeah, I, that, that is a pretty, that sounds like something I would like to do. That would be pretty fun, actually. I didn't think of Dovescape. I think it's a pretty decent, uh, 
commander for a blue white spell slinger deck yeah. but i'm also concerned like you said that it's it's not gonna be a fun commander because if you sit down to build it you're right like you're gonna come across time warp and you're gonna be like oh okay like that's what you do with tigum every single it time makes sense. yeah like that's like if you look at all the instances sorceries and magic that's clearly the it's right on curve five mana after your tigum it's clearly what you should be doing with it and that just doesn't especially lead to fun games mm -hmm. i do want to give a quick shout out to legacy i think there's a chance that this could be a sideboard like mirror breaker card in older formats and you're if you're playing miracles just got banned but the blue white control deck is still in the format if you're playing force of will counter spell battles Tigum's a pretty good way to end those shenanigans and make sure that you're coming out on top. Rebounding Brainstorms and Ponders is actually pretty effective. Like, it's pretty cheap and easy, and doubling up on them is good. So I think there's an outside chance that it could pop up here and there in older formats. But in Commander, I'm... I'm going to be really scared if someone plays this across the table for me. I'm going to assume, like, I need to kill that, because if not, I'm never going to get another turn. Yeah, that's that's the unfortunate thing. I, I didn't think about the legacy thing. That's really cool. A 3-4 three, four, three, four creature that can't that your abilities can't be countered, and you also get a rebound on your opponent and stuff. That's neat. Yeah. But yeah, and Commander, he, he really wants to be built a certain way, and that way is already done but better by Narset, I feel. So... Well, let's move on to the non-commander cards from the dragon deck. And we have a bunch more dragons, just not legendary dragons. First up, Scale Lord Reckoner, which uh, is kind of the karmic justice of the dragon mm -hmm. tribe, so to speak. So, Tomer, what do you think about this flyer? I actually like it quite a bit. Um, it's a 4-4 four, four flyer for 5, which is not that appealing right off the bat, but... You have to think about the dragon tribe and what it's good against and what it's bad against. In my opinion, if you're playing an Ur Dragon deck and you're about you're all about actually casting your dragons one at a time, they cost a lot of mana, so you're probably going to cast one or two dragons per turn maximum, and each of them are a very big threat and each of them deserve an answer. This means that you're actually quite resilient to board wipes because you're not going to be committing that many spells each turn. You're only going to be, you only have the mana to cast one or two each turn. So you're going to have a good amount of fuel still left in your hand at any time. You're not over committing. The downside is since all your threats are single entities and they cost a great deal of mana, you're actually at a disadvantage to very cheap, efficient, targeted removal, such as Swords to Plowshares, such as Path to Exile, such as a Doomblade effect. And Scale Lord Reckoner is actually really, really good at shoring up that weakness for the Dragon Archetype, specifically for the Ur-Dragon ar Archetype. So each threat is going to be entering the battlefield. It's already You're already well protected indirectly from wrath effects because you're not over committing and then scale lord reckoner says okay and also those swords to plowshares and everything yeah there's those are not going to happen either <laughs> yeah, i mean they could happen but there's a, a significant rattlesnake effect on it yeah, it definitely makes people think twice before killing your stuff, because you get to choose a permanent, so you get to kill your opponent's best creature, best uh, artifact, enchantment, whatever it may be, so it's a really big cost if your opponent wants to kill one of your dragons, so I think it's pretty good. The only thing that's a little awkward is it's white, which means it's pretty good in the Ur Dragon's five-color dragon deck, but I think if you're building... Outside of five color dragons, you're probably white is probably near the bottom of colors that you would be yeah. in for a dragon deck, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's appropriate. This is definitely a white effect, and this is definitely a Dromoka a dragon from cons or dragons of Tarkir, rather. So I think I think it's a, the correct color and the correct effect for the color, and it's the correct lore for the color or for the card. But yeah, it is a bit unfortunate that red uh, dragons are generally red. And if you want to have a mono red commander dragon, then you're not going to have access to this. Uh, let's move on to our next dragon. Super above the curve stat wise, Territorial Hellkite. It, it's actually very similar to Ruhan of the Fomori, which is one of the original commander generals from the first pre constructed set. I think that was like 2012. Um,. That was a 7-7 that didn't have any other abilities on it, no other keywords. But at the beginning of combat, you you have to attack with it, and 
you have to pick a random opponent to attack. Territorial Hydra Hellkite seems like just a better version of Ruhan. Obviously, it's not a commander. You can't use that as a commander. But it's just more efficient at the same ways that Ruhan wanted it to be. So Territorial Hellkite is a 6-5 flying haste instead of a 7-7. Seven, seven, but they, it has the same converted mana cost. So it immediately starts attacking. It has flying. It has haste. These are great keywords. It does a lot of damage. Right off the bat. The downside is you can't pick your opponents. So obviously you can't hit the person that maybe you necessarily wanted to. But you can actually use that as a political tool. People can't be that upset at you for attacking them if you say you don't have a choice in the matter. And Territorial Hellkite doesn't give you choice in the matter. So if you get cracked of a, a Hellkite, you can't be like, oh, well, I'm going to attack you back because you did that to me. I mean, you could, but... I, most people won't. So I, I like the political aspect of it. I like that it is very powerful in multiplayer. It's a very traditional way of dealing damage, but it scales really well in a 40 life format. This is, there's no way this would be ever printed and allowed in a one versus one format with 20 life totals. It's just way too much damage right off the bat. But because it is a multiplayer format and the card embraces the fact that it's a multiplayer format by being by randomly uh, selecting who you attack, you're allowed to deal this much damage for such a low converted mana cost. So I really like this card. Well, let's move on to our next dragon, Boneyard Scourge, the recursive dragon from the set. It seems like this is becoming traditional in Commander. We get a <laughs> recursive dragon. So this one uh, is pretty powerful, although you definitely need to be dragon tribal, I think, to make it work. What do you think of this one, Tomer? I think it could have been really, really sweet. It has all the right words, except to just add a dragon there, and that's <laughs> what really brings me down a bit. It could, have, it would have been really sweet in a sacrifice deck, which is a very popular um, theme or archetype in black decks, uh, where you can abuse its cheap reanimation to continually sacrifice it for value. For example, you could draw a bunch of cards off it, Disciple of Bolas, and then eventually just bring it back from the graveyard to use it for other sacrifice abilities. But the problem is that it only triggers off dragons, and dragon tribal decks just don't have sacrifice themes, or I don't know of any that have sacrifice themes. So it's okay in a dragon deck, but it's not great. Yeah, I think that's a big problem. The The card is really cool, but it just doesn't fit what dragons are normally trying to do. I guess it can kind of be like some sort of weird removal protection in a dragon deck. Like your opponent kills it and then eventually they kill another dragon and you get it back. Kind of protection from a wrath. But it's only a 4-3, so it's not even that big of a threat just to yeah. get back. So I don't know. I think it's a cool card, but I just don't think it fits what most dragon decks are trying to do. So it probably won't be too heavily played. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on to one of my favorite cards from all of commander moving into the non dragons <laughs> fractured identity. So uh, this card just makes me want to phage people. Is mm -hmm. there any, is there any purpose of fractured identity beyond trying to against the odds, your opponents out of the game with phage? Well, I mean, that is obviously the biggest draw about about playing Fractured Identity. Unfortunately, you can't have Phage as your commander, which is actually probably a, a better thing if, if you're trying to go <laughs> for something more efficient. You want to be at least Esper. You want to play Phage the Attachable. You want to make you want to exile your own Phage so everybody gets all your opponents get a copy of her, and because she wasn't cast from your hand, they immediately lose the game. This is what people are going to go for. It's a really cute gimmick. Uh, I'm excited for it to happen to me because I'm assuming you're going to do that to me at some point. <laughs> uh, not until November, but I'm going to try. <laughs> not until November. Uh, <laughs> that sucks. Um, but in general, it's I, I don't know any other things that are that abusable of Fractured Identity, but it seems more of just like a, a good political card. If you have an opponent that is clearly the arch enemy, that is clearly ahead at the table, you can exile their biggest threat and then help everybody else by having a copy of that threat. So it's a really good way of taking down an arch enemy. It's also pretty interesting if you were running a tokens deck and you're running Fractured Identity, that way you're actually getting more value out of the card than your opponents. Um, let's say you have Anointed pr pr Procession, Doubling Season, Parallel Lives, and you exiled a opponent, opposing creature. 
Uh, your opponents get a token, but you'll get two or three or more tokens. And it's even better if you have like ways of like continually doubling those tokens. So like root board of defenses has the populate mechanic where you can double a token. So you can go pretty deep and maybe a tokens deck that is in bant colors, for example, might like it. But otherwise, it's mostly a political card, mostly a, a fade shenanigans card. Yeah, it seems sweet for token decks and phage decks. The thing I worry about with just using it as a removal spell is being sorcery speed makes it really risky. If you yeah. think of, like, you tap out, you exile your opponent's Eldrazi, that means two people before you get to attack with an Eldrazi, which uh, could mean your board is getting annihilated and bad things are happening to you. So I think it would be much more powerful as a fair card if it was an instant and you could cast it just before your turn's about to start, you get the first use out of whatever you get the token of. So I think you need to be doing something pretty specific with it to make it good. I don't think you can just play it as a uh, removal, uh, as a vindicate, essentially. I think it's a little too risky to do that for the most part. It's also strange that they made it a sorcery when it costs so much already. <laughs> like, I think it, it could have been an instant no problem. Let's move on to the Blue Kindred. Kindred Discovery, kind of a uh, coastal piracy on steroids, but only for yeah. sty- uh, only for tribal decks. What do you think of this one, Tomer? Um, I mean, in a tribal deck, I think Kindred Discovery is the best out of there. I don't know. I, this is my favorite. This is a draw card. I, that, that's where <laughs> it won me over. Um, in a tribal deck, it's basically a better combination of coastal piracy and then one half of dire undercurrents, where it says like whenever a blue creature comes into play under your control, you can draw a card. Um, so you get you get to draw a card when you're when a creature of the chosen type enters the battlefield and when it attacks. So you get the best of both worlds. It's going to be a lot of card draw in any tribe, uh, any blue tribe. Essentially, it's basically an auto include in my in my head at least. Um, it's also a lot of people have been mentioning how you can go infinite with this and the Locust God. The Locust God um, produces a one one insect creature every single time you draw a card. And then obviously, if you chose the creature type insect with Kindred of Discovery, as soon as an insect enters the battlefield, then you draw a card, which makes you uh, make another insect, which makes you draw a card. Um, so you will draw out your entire deck very, very quickly. And then if you have a laboratory maniac already on the battlefield, you will win the game. Otherwise, you will lose the game. <laughs> but um, Or if you have any instant speed way of dealing with Kindred Discovery before you would mill yourself out, then you'll probably win the game anyway. So it, it's pretty, it's really pretty powerful. Um, I also like it in Tauran Sky Summoner, because every single time you cast an instant or sorcery with Tauran, you make a Drake. So all of a sudden, all your creatures... Um, all, all your instants and sorceries draw you a card, and they can draw you more cards if they get to attack. So, um, yeah, it's it's a really powerful enchantment. Yeah, it's super strong. I think it is the best of the similar cards if you're a tribal deck. So I think you would definitely tend to play it. And I hadn't even really considered how it could be good with cards that make tokens of a certain type. So that's an interesting idea, too. Like, the Locust God isn't necessarily a tribal deck or Talrand isn't a tribal deck, but you can still take advantage of Kinder Discovery for a ton of card advantage. So I think it's going to be pretty good. It's also interesting since we have Ixalan on the horizon and we know that's a tribal themed creature type matter theme set. So I think for cards like Kinder Discovery and really Commander 2017 in general, I'm hopeful that we're going to get some sweet tribes and additions to the Commander 2017 tribes in just another month or so when Ixalan comes out. Yeah, I definitely think this pre-constructed or Commander 2017 was definitely built in parallel with Ixalan and even Amonkhet block. Like we saw the cat deck and sure enough, we also saw some cat lords in Amonkhet block that were not printed in the cat deck. So obviously there was an intention of people um, getting these cat lords from Amonkhet block and putting them into the cat deck if they want to upgrade. Similarly, there's going to be, I think there's going to be more hints like this one that you pointed out that lead to shenanigans into Ixalan. Well, let's move on to Fortunate Few, sort of the new Wrath, I guess, the Commander 2017 edition of a Wrath. What do you think of uh, of this one? It has some cool multiplayer implications. Uh, where does this rank in the Wrath scale? Uh, I'll keep it brief. I don't like it. <laughs> I, I I don't like that. I, I would have really liked this card. And I think this is a huge missed opportunity 
if it was a soft board wipe in the sense that you get to choose a permanent you control and then each other opponent, uh, each other player chooses a permanent they don't control. That way you actually get ahead on this board wipe while your opponents might not be and they have to squabble of which, which permanent gets to survive. I really like that style of play. You get to see it in like the offering cycle. Um, and I think this is just a missed opportunity. I, I don't know what I can say that's good about this card. We also have a couple, well, a few uncommons from the set. We talked about Harold's Horn a bit yesterday. Mirror of the Forebearers we haven't talked about. Any thoughts on that one, Tomer? Um, well, we've talked about Mirage Mirror recently, which came out in the Amicant block. And that let you copy basically anything on the board, any permanent essentially on the board, um, except for planeswalkers. And this one just lets you copy a creature that you control. And it has to be, uh, that creature type. And I just feel it's very restrictive and not that interesting for that reason. However, it is a little bit cheaper than Mirage Mirror, even though it's not as flexible. And there are a lot of cards out there, tribal cards out there that are going to be really fun to copy. For example, Priest of Titania, if you're in an elf deck, um, it lets you tap uh, and produce a green mana for each elf in play. So if you copy a Priest of Titania um, and have another version of it, you have a lot of mana working for you. If you're in a sliver deck and you just copy basically any sliver, then, well, you have another sliver that's going <laughs> to do crazy things. So it's it still has its use. It's still fun. I'm just not that excited about it. Yeah, it looks pretty bad compared to Mirage Mirror. I think that's the biggest problem. If we hadn't just gotten Mirage Mirror, this would probably be more exciting. But I don't think, since we have Mirage Mirror, that this is necessarily all that exciting of a card. I can imagine playing it in tribal decks, and it'll probably do fun things. But for the most part, I think just play your Mirage Mirror and you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And finally, we got some more curses. We talked about Curse of Bounty. Any thoughts on Curse of uh, Opulence or Curse of Verbosity? Oh my goodness. I love both of these. They're my two my they're my two favorites. So uh Curse of Opulence, let's start it off with that. Um Curse of Opulence is a interesting sort of mana accelerant that it's certain it, it's useful in basically any deck because any deck wants to have more mana to cast more spells to first cast your bigger spells if you don't have the mana to cast them or just cast more spells per turn which is also incredibly powerful in basically any deck so i like that this curse highly encourages your opponents to attack whoever you curse some of them like curse of vitality for example are not that interesting um, or not that high incentive for your opponents to actually attack the cursed player. But I feel like a lot of people are going to be like, yeah, I actually do. I could use an extra mana. Yeah, I'm going to attack that person instead of that other person or attack you instead. Um, so I really like Curse of Opulence for, for that incentive. I think the, the payoff is really good, especially for just one mana. It's the cheapest of the curses and very powerful that way. Um, and then if you're actually in a deck that really takes advantage of the fact that you're making a gold token, things get a lot more fun. It's a artifact token. So you can actually take advantage of a lot of artifact synergies. It helps turn on metal craft, for example, for cards like this patch. Um, it's also really good for affinity cards. It's also really good for cards that are totally not metal craft, but they're, they're metal craft, like inventors fair or even improvised cards. It can help with improvise. You can tap them instead of actually sacrificing them to get a, a mana reduction. And there's also just like other cool um, artifact synergies that you can take advantage of with the tokens. And also it's in red. And the two most um, supported colors for artifacts are blue and red. So you can run it in Brea Ethereum Shaper, for example. You can also run it in a Duretti deck. You can run it in a bunch of artifact decks that are going to really take advantage of these artifact tokens yeah i think our uh, curse of opulence is one of the more powerful ones you always need mana so there's i mean it's a great ability to have in commander you can almost never have too much mana no matter how much you have it's not like standard or modern where your deck gets to like five lands and you're like all right i never want to draw land again you want as much mana as possible yep and Cursa does a good way of adding mana, and it comes down really early in the game. What about uh, the blue curse? Any thoughts on Verbosity? Well, this is my favorite one. <laughs> I don't <laughs> it think it should draw be a, a surprise. Card. <laughs> it's a draw card. It's a draw card. And you know what? 
one of the, my favorite decks and one of my most powerful decks is Edric, Spy Master of Tress. Everybody likes drawing cards. Everybody likes drawing cards. Even people who say they don't like like blue, they like drawing cards, though. So I think if you curse somebody with this, they're going to be attacked. Like, this is a very high and very effective incentive. Um, and you get to draw cards off it, obviously, and your opponents get to draw cards. And when your opponents get to draw cards, you get to draw cards. So despite you coming up so far ahead with this curse, you're, I don't think your opponents will be able to help themselves. They're going to still still give you those card draws, still attack the person you curse. It's just too tempting. All my playtesting with Edric Spymaster Tress has told me that if you dangle card draw in front of people's heads, they will do whatever it takes to draw those cards. Yeah, that is definitely true. So I think this is... Is close to, like, a ghostly prison as we get out of all the curses. Like, this is really going to keep people from attacking you because, uh, along with making mana, called mana and cards, those are the exact things that you want to play a game of Commander. <laughs> so yep. I think that, uh, yeah, these are curses that actually make me a little bit excited to have them around. We talked about the ones yesterday, and we're kind of like, uh, game to life, okay, on having my stuff, awful. I guess that's... <laughs> Uh, like, sort of a thing, but drawing cards and making manners are sweet. So it's nice that at least some of the new curses are actually pretty playable. Yeah, and let's say your opponents just attack the curse target five times total throughout the game, five times total. That means they drew five cards throughout, distributed amongst them, but you also drew five cards off that. It's an, it's an insane value when you really think about it. You think about the net gain that you got and how much life total you saved and how much life total you dealt by by convincing your opponents to attack that person for that card draw. It's just, it's really good. It's it's probably my favorite pow- most powerful card in the set or like top 10 that most people are just going to overlook in general. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of Draconic Domination. So, Tomer, any last thoughts on the deck on the way out the door today? Deck looks sweet, man. I I haven't had a chance to actually sit down and play with the cards, but I have a pretty good idea of how it works. I've seen playtests of it. I know the deck list. I understand all the ratios of it. It could get a little bit of a better mana base. I know a lot of people have been griping about that recently. Um, it could have tweaks here and there. It could have a all the decks can have tweaks here and there. Uh, but if you want to play the big flashy battle cruiser magic, the Elder Dragon Highlander experience, you pick up Draconic Domination. It's it's really fun. <laughs> Anyway, that brings us to the end of our Commander 2017 review for the Dragon Deck Draconic Domination. Tomer, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out. It's always fun. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. And thanks to everyone for watching. So we'll be back tomorrow with another one. Until then, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.